And as I mentioned, uh, the, the second approach uh, is based on double di diagonalization, basically using uh, or having two matrices which are positive, definite, and symmetric, you can find a matrix Q such that they are both diagonalized at the same time. And uh, K, for example, is Q transpose Q, and M is Q transpose lambda Q, where lambda is diagonal. So, and then, by doing a coordinate transformation with this matrix Q, and by choosing KD, again in this, this form where D is in this case diagonal, um, you can easily show that, uh, basically using this KD, in, in the new variables, you have a, a diagonal system. This is based on modal decoupling, basically. Um, and then, if you choose D such that, again, D is 2 psi square root of lambda i, uh, th these elements are diagonal, so it's easy to take the square root. Again, you, you have the, the desired behavior. And now I will show some features. I, if everything goes well, um, Florian and Dominic will show this within the hands-on um, session this afternoon, but for any case, I will show this. I, this is what I'm showing in the lecture as well. Um, I don't have a sound. Huh? Can I have the sound? Patrick? Can some... Okay, no, forget it. If it takes too long, then, then I, I'll do it without sound. Sorry? My mic? Okay, yeah, I can do that. So, this was just Cartesian control where in one direction, in one direction you have uh, zero stiff, uh, of very low stiffness and very low damping, while in the other direction you have high damping, so you can really um, um, do what the... can really very well decouple the systems in, uh, in uh, Cartesian coordinates, both in terms of stiffness and damping. And you have seen the null space motion as well. And now the system is well damped in any direction with some medium stiffness. What does it do? and then some zero stiffness in a vertical plane, so you can freely move and have just some constraints uh, uh, normal to the plane. And that's why I wanted the sound. This is if you use just a Euler angular representation and have some singularity at 90 degrees. That's, that's the singularity of, at beta equal 90 degrees from some Euler angles. And this is the quaternion-based implementation here now for a very small stiffness, almost zero stiffness. So you see you are stable. Uh, sorry, there's a typo. And then this quaternion representation where you have an unstable equilibrium point, you have a very soft compliance. So there you can see the unstable equilibrium point, and if you disturb the system, then it will move to the, to the stable equilibrium. And then null space stiffness, again, zero null space stiffness in this case. And uh, of course, it's hard to push exactly in the null space if you push exactly in the null space because the system has a compliance at the tip as well. And here we have some, some high stiffness. And then singularity avoidance. Um, yeah. Here you have just zero Cartesian force while you are passing the singularity. Okay. Of course, it's based on Jac the Copeland transpose, so nothing bad happens if you are going through the singularity, but you are using mobility, of course. And then if you switch the singularity avoidance on, and you have this potential not allowing you to go into, enter into the singularity. And then this is the basic controller we have with uh, gravity compensation. And it's important to have a really good torque interface and designing the torque sensor such that you really can provide a torque interface and use, can, can really use those, those control approaches accessing the control interface. This was a, a huge work, actually. Um, yeah, just playing around a little bit with the robot. 
was, I think, just at the time Sami started at Yellow with his, his master thesis. He did this movie for, for my lecture. And then, uh, well, we use the torque sensors not only for compliance control, but this is the behavior of the system with some load if the uh, motors are switched off. So you have a lot of intrinsic compliance indeed. And that's why industrial robots are so big and heavy, because they want to work with a PD controller and avoid any complex control. While we accepted, you know, to build very lightweight robots, accepted those compliances, and are using the torque sensor to do active vibration damping. And this was a key point to, to um, performance control. And here is the collision detection uh, Sami developed and implemented based on the torque sensors uh, again, because you are measuring on the link side, you are not affected by friction, and you can uh, trigger this collision detection within one millisecond, and also use the torque control to, to limit the forces. <coughs> um, and of course, at the end, you are summing up the potentials, um, both the potentials and the torques. Um, and if you do that, of course, the equilibrium is not necessarily unique anymore. This has some drawbacks. Of course, you could have many local minima. Um, probably your potentials or your force fields will not have one uh, equal or not, not the same equilibrium point, so the, the force will fight each other. And of course, the solution is the well-known prioritization uh, through null space projection. This is something also propagated by Osama for many years. So having a first level task and then a second problem, which is solved only if not in conflict with the, with the first one and so on. And uh, the approach is also basically well known. Uh, you are using a Jacobian transpose for the primary task and then do a null space projection using the pseudo inverse of the Jacobian transpose, which might be dynamically consistent or, or not, and defining a null space vector. And uh, you can do this hierarchically, of course. So having several tasks, you define a joint from your initial potential UI, as we defined it in some, some arbitrary coordinates, and then multiply it by the Jacobian in order to, to get the torques in, uh, yeah, in joint level. And then you can do a nested system with you know, the primary task, and then in the null space of the primary task, project everything else, namely the secondary task and the third task projecting in the null space of the secondary, and so on. Uh, and just a remark on that, because we had a discussion with Osama some time ago whether the, by this projection things remain passive or not. And the answer is that indeed the projection preserves passivity. You can show that even if you cut something off of this torque T2 and basically off of this potential U2, uh, the system is still passive. But what happens is that the uniqueness, I mean, you might design this tau 2 that, such that it has one uh, global equilibrium, but because you project something, you might lose the one equilibrium. So uh, it's not, uh, not necessarily well, well defined. So you still are passive, just to understand that. I mean, assume you have a desired position x desired, and you stay at x, and you are in the 2D uh, Cartesian space, of course you have one global minimum. Now if you project on one manifold, which could be uh, like this one, like, let's say this manifold is an null space manifold, then in this case you might not have just a unique equilibrium through the projection, but an undefined equilibrium or several equilibrium points. While if you are lucky and you know, the manifold is like this, you might have one unique equilibrium. So it really depends on the shape of, of the null space manifold, what happens. But at least, as you can imagine from here, this mechanical analogy, having a point moving on a manifold attached to a spring, it will stay passive, of course. Um, OK. So this was it on, on, uh, on the impedance control of, of, uh, of the rigid robot. And now I will move to the flexible joint case. And uh, as I mentioned, you have seen this video. Uh, the baseline is the joint torque controller. And you need a joint torque controller, which is very compliant because, I mean, which compensates for friction. Of course, you need a good model of the robot, gravity compensation and so on. Um, so because you assume an ideal torque source at joint level. While, as Neville mentioned yesterday, uh, in the rigid robot model, it's hard to do force control because the joint torque is not a state, actually. Joint torque is something related to accelerations, and the accelerations are, are not state of the system. They are related to, to the derivative of the state. Uh, so strictly speaking, a torque controller with a P-term is not causal for a rigid robot. 
So uh, only if you take into consideration the compliances, uh, the, the torque is really becoming uh, a state. And this is the difference between the rigid robot and the, the flexible joint model. You need to distinguish between motor position and link side position, between motor velocity and link side velocity. And then for each joint, you have a fourth order system with theta, theta dot on motor side, q, q dot on link side. And we are using for all our controllers basically these states space uh, this state's vector, uh, which is a linear transformation of, of the first one using uh, motor position, motor velocity, torque, and torque derivative, while you have you know, the simple linear transformation from theta and q to, to tau. And then the equations look very much like the original equations with the rigid body dynamics, but the input is a torque and torque derivative, if you consider also the damping here, and this torque and torque derivative is related to the input motor torque to another second order differential equation, and this is the um, joint spring relation. And we are using this state for all control approaches on uh, joint and Cartesian level for torque control, position control, impedance control, and we are using the passivity formalism um, because on, if you are taking into account the flexibilities, you can stay within the passivity formalism and still solve many problems. Um, and just to, to have an idea of that, just look at the rigid body dynamics and the robot is contacting a passive um, environment. Of course, this is passive. Assume the uh, environment is passive. Then you have the actuator dynamics given by an inertia and damper and the spring. And um, we designed this fourth order state feedback controller in such a way that, of course, the state feedback controller is an active one doing, for example, active vibration damping. But we can show that the interconnection of the controller with the motor dynamics provides a passive system by itself. And then by interconnecting passive systems, you provide the overall stability and um, can make some uh, convergence analysis based on that. And I have shown this already. Basically, I, I was afraid at the beginning of the comparison on the tracking performance of those robots with the KUKA robot. But it turned out when they, we did the ISO test with the KUKA robot moving the same load, 14 kilograms, and which has a weight of four, 250 kilograms, that we won in three of the five categories they had there for testing. So setting time and remaining error and so on. And this is just because of the advanced control methods. Are executed by the arms, Sorry. torso, and mobile platform. And then you can do even, uh, it's a bit dark because of the high speed motion, but this kind of very fast motions with the robot where you can catch bolts which are tracked by, by the stereo cameras and the motion takes like half a second. And despite of all of these compliances of the system, still, you know, which, which uh, of course propagate over the structure, you are still able to, to, to catch the ball with Justin. And I won't go into details with this, but just try to give you an intuition of, of the passivity framework we have here. Of course, um, as in the rigid case, feeding back position, motor position and motor velocity provides the uh, impedance controller, which gives you asymptotic stabilization around desired position for zero external torque and implements the desired um, uh, compliance and also provides the desired damping. But it turns out that feeding back torque and torque derivative, which is, by the way, uh, the main difference is that you have a collocated sensor which is close to the, to the actuator in, con in contrast to the force torque sensor in the wrist. So by, by doing this, you can interpret the torque feedback as shaping the kinetic energy of the actuators, basically. And, uh, they are used for damping the vibrations and increasing the performance. So all in all, you have a simple, uh, physical interpretation for the full state feedback. So shaping kinetic energy with a torque, shaping the potential energy and providing some damping with the, with the positions. And uh, if you look at the torque controller, again, this is the first equation with torque, torque derivative, input, motor current and, and uh, motor inertia. And having just a simple PD controller on, on torque level, which is a bit rewritten in order to, to have a, a a better notation, but basically feedback torque and torque derivative, and have a new input U, then it turns out that the closed loop dynamics looks like this, where you have the new control input, but a part of that you have exactly the same structure with a mod modified inertia B theta. So that means that the effect of this torque feedback is that you scale down the motor inertia from B to, to B theta. 
and yeah, that's the physical interpretation for the torque feedback. And to make it more uh, graphical, again, we have this block diagram of the robot dynamics, motor inertia. You have maybe some friction. And the motor inertia can be, the, the reflected motor inertia can be quite large because we have quite high gear ratios of 160. And this is multiplied by the square of the gear ratio. So B is about the same order of magnitude as the link side inertia or even larger. While the effect of the torque feedback, as I mentioned, is that it reduces B. So you have a more ideal actuator. It reduces the force as well. And then on top of that, so basically for the stability analysis, you don't need to take into consideration the torque feedback. You just say, I take this reduced virtual inertia of the actuator. And then on top of that, you put the impedance controller. And this is the unified approach we are using for torque position, impedance control on Cartesian and joint level, basically. And just to, to repeat that, basically the friction is reduced by the gain of the torque controller plus one and uh, the inertia as well. And the big advantage is that by staying in the robustness in the passivity framework, you have robustness with respect to unknown or uh, modeling errors in the dynamics, and also what's more important to the environment. For example, if you are contacting a human, you never have precise models of the human dynamics, while passivity at least uh, gives you some very strong robustness properties. And then, of course, if you you can do stability analysis by defining the upon of functions where you put all the energy terms, kinetic energy of the link side, of the motor side, then uh, potential energy written in this form, you know, in this differential form, basically, where you have the potential energy of the robot, gravity uh, of the joint springs, and of the controller. So of, uh, of the Cartesian controller, all, all, all the potentials I mentioned before. And if you are doing the derivative of this, of course, you will contain all dissipative terms of the controllers and of, of the system. And at least you will have stability. And if the, the potentials are designed properly, you might have also uh, asymptotic convergence. Well, and using this concept then, in the following year, years with Christian Ott, uh, Thomas Wimberg, we extended this gradually to more and more complex systems. And the intuition you need to have is always the same. You have some springs in order to grasp something. You have some springs connecting the fingers to the middle of the object, and then some additional spring moving the object away. And you can see this here for, I, I can repeat the videos, for opening this. this can, um, this is just a screw motion, basically. You define uh, uh, simultaneous rotation and, and translation and define the appropriate stiffnesses, while this is an impedance controller now in object coordinates, so in a coordinate frame related to the center of the object. But then you have just another, um, another generalized coordinate. And of course, you have to take into account the kinematics and dynamics of parallel structure, but it's more or less a straightforward extension of these ideas. So what you always have is, roughly speaking, a gravity compensation and uh, uh, derivative of, of, of a potential and then adding some damping term. And here you see for this complex system, you can interact in the null space where you define some springs for squeezing the object. Or here some springs, this is some work done by Christian and Thomas Wimberg. Uh, some springs to squeeze the object and another spring to pull the robot around. And then you hierarchically can construct more and more complex uh, potentials for grasping the object with a hand and squeezing the object between the two hands, then attaching the spring to a virtual object. This is some idea coming from Stefano Stramigioli uh, of um, passive implementation of object-based impedance control. And then even more complex systems here, the mobile platform where we have extendable legs. The platform is the only part which has no torque sensing inside, basically. And because the system is quite strong and you can lift up up to 20 kilograms, you need a large supporting polygon for heavy objects. So that's why we have a special kinematics where you can use just the wheels. So we have eight motors, two for the rotations, and then uh, eight for the, uh, sorry, four for the rotations and four for uh, moving the, the wheels, and you can uh, use the driving motors also to extend the legs by unlocking some, some clutches. Okay, and here you see the interaction, the impedance control basically for the 
a whole system with 33 degrees of freedom, 150 kilograms of weight, but you can easily interact with the system. And as I mentioned, we have the impedance control for the whole structure, starting from the arms down to the base. But since the base has no torque sensors, we have to go to admittance control to command that. So basically, the virtual forces F commanded from, from those springs transformed to the base are then used on an admittance approach on a virtual mass and damper to command desired velocities for the base. And that's the way you can interact with the whole structure. Um, and then, of course, it turned out that having those potentials and those many behaviors is a nice thing, but people in the industry tend to have difficulties then parameterizing this, and you have so many parameters to tune. So we were trying to have a, an assembly planning toolbox and provide them higher level tools for, for assembling and provided the geometrical model of the tools you would like to assemble, for example, from image processing or from CAD and providing some additional information like tolerance, material properties, camera accuracy, and so on, uh, you would like to automatically generate some KUKA code, for example, the robot control code, uh, which then can be uh, augmented with online data like position estimation from vision, workspace limitations, and so on. And again, the idea is based on the impedance controller. Instead of moving very precisely to a position, you use the impedance controller, and you need to roughly only know the, the position of the hole from the vision. And the idea is you command some desired position somewhere uh, out, basically, of, 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 of the hole, and use a compliance system in, in, in this direction in order to move towards this goal and limit the forces. And, uh, of course, you would like to do this as robust as possible. So the motion is something like that. And you would like to do this as robust as possible. So uh, you would like to find automatically the optimal stiffness and the optimal region of insertion and the optimal motion to, uh, to maximize your robustness. And you can use the stability and convergence analysis, to analysis tools to do that. Basically, you are maximizing the region of attraction, this wide region where you can insert. and uh, um, the impedance controller will still converge. And this convergence is, of course, determined by, by the shape, by the geometrical shape of the contour, and not only by the spring. And you have seen here, first, the vision where the, um, this is what something we demonstrated on, on an ICRA. We're using the vision to track the object, and then in contact, we switch using the collision detection developed by Summit to, co to compliance control. So we move with high accuracy, switch to compliance control in contact, such that we can limit the forces you have uh, seen the, the compliant behavior. And um, I, I mentioned the collision detection, so this brings me to another issue we, we uh, have under this soft robotics concept, namely the safety. When we commercialized the systems, the first thing KUKA was asking us is, uh, well, you have all these nice features, but how can we uh, convince the insurances that this is indeed safe, and what happens if something fails? So that's how we started uh, the PhD thesis of, of Sami Haddadin, who just uh, finished his, his thesis now, on, on the topics of uh, robot safety in the beginning, and now it, it extended more and more towards human-robot interaction. And we've been the first to do real experiments of uh, of um, uh, impacts, and it turned out that for the lightweight robot, a robot seen from point of view of, of, of uh, automotive crash test injuries is not dangerous at all. Basically, for all the cr criteria they have in automotive industry, the the robot to, uh, turned out not to be to be dangerous. While of course um, the automotive people have other requirements and criteria than we would have in robotics. They are happy if you survive your accident, while in robotics you would have basically insurances say today that uh, you should not have more than a hematome. So that's why we started to do more and more experiments, and many of you probably know these results, so some have become very famous with these experiments. We did experiments with these dummies and uh, with big robots and small robots, and then with sharp tools and biological materials for years and years. And to, to convince the last skeptical people he did this, this famous self-experiment, which brought him to CNN and Discovery Channel. But uh, at that time, he was completely sure that nothing can, can happen. But people still starting to say, you know, what if this and what if that? So um, what is this approach based on? Basically, 
you have again this block representation of the rigid body dynamics, motor dynamics, joint torque in between. And uh, the classical approach, also implemented in the industrial robots, is having an, um, an disturbance observer using, sorry, using the uh, motor torque and uh, the position in order to, uh, to, to observe the disturbance. The drawback is, of course, that you uh, can observe only uh, the sum of the external torque and the friction torque. And since the friction torque is pretty large, uh, the estimation of the external torque can be very inaccurate. For example, our gearboxes have an efficiency of about 60% only, so 40% of the torque goes into friction. And because we can measure the joint torque in between, of course, we have the advantage of uh, being able to do only a partial observer and observing only the interaction force on one side. On the other side, you can do a second observer for the other subsystem and without being affected by the external torque, for example, by the interaction torque for the impedance control, you can precisely observe the friction torque and then use this for friction compensation and even um, have better performance of, of the joint torque control level, which is a crucial aspect. Now, let me see how, how much time do I have. I think like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. So I will come to the last topic, um, namely to the, our current research in, um, in uh, mechatronics and our current developments. And as I mentioned so far in the systems in the lightweight robot, the joint flexibility has been rather regarded as a drawback you need to, to deal with. While we noticed that this compliance is also for the controller performance is beneficial if you are in contact. So people started in the last 10 years to think about uh, robot compliance is not as a drawback, but maybe as a feature for many cases. For example, for interaction with unknown environments, for the dynamic performance, because you can store energy using these compliances. And uh, because it provides mechanical robot robustness in case of failure or impact, and of course for safe interaction f with humans if you have also the appropriate control strategies. And there have been several developments starting from serial selectic actuators and then worldwide in Japan. Antonio was one of the first. Um, Osama had also some, some concepts at Stanford doing variable compliance actuation. And we have now basically the motivation which Markus Grevenstein will give this afternoon a detailed talk exactly about this topic. And his motivation video is this one uh, showing a case where Asimo had a failure. It behaves as a humanoid, but if something fails, you notice that the system is rigid and it can be easily destroyed. While some humans, not all of us, but uh, are able to do things like that using their compliance. Um, so this brought the idea of introducing mechanical compliance into the systems, inspired, of course, by the uh, biological systems of having agonist and uh, antagonist um, muscle as to actuation. And in order to implement this in a mechanical system, you need, of course, two motors. This is a drawback of the concept. And you need to insert nonlinear springs, because what you would like is not only to move the position by moving both motors, but by doing some co-contraction, you would like to adjust the stiffness of the system. And in order to adjust the stiffness, you need um, a spring characteristic. So this would be the torque, this would be the position, which is nonlinear because the stiffness is, of course, the tangent uh, at the working point to this curve. And the last four or five years we spend in developing uh, uh, this variable compliance system, which is a very complex one because you have the num uh, double number of actuators. Like I said, Marcus will go into details, but only the hand has 19 independent degree of freedom. This time it's really human size and uh, you have 38 actuators in the hand only. No torque sensor because you can use the stiffness, the deflection of, of, of the spring and the known stiffness to estimate the torques in this case, so you have only positional sensing. And just to give you an idea of how the, the nonlinear stiffness is implemented for the fingers, for example, it's a simple mechanism where you use a tendon and you push with the spring from the side. And um, by having a loose tendon, uh, then uh, this angle gets be uh, larger, so the system is more compliant while for a uh, stiffened tendon, the effect of the spring is very low. And uh, in, in the limit case, when uh, the, the tendon is completely straight and the system is rigid. And for the arms, 
This is a development by Sebastian Wolf and some colleagues, uh, Oliver Eiberger. Basically, we try to avoid it using two motors, but using only one motor and the second smaller, one big motor and the second smaller motor to adjust the stiffness in order to save weight and space. Uh, I won't go into details, but uh, now we are on the way of uh, improving the control and doing some iterations of the system. It's like with our first generations of lightweight robot, you need to change a lot of things until the performance is, is, is really good, but uh, from control point of view, we will extend the passivity-based control approaches through uh, deal variable nonlinear stiffness, strongly coupled joints. So these are the challenges we have this, with these new systems, and we are with together with I mean, Viactors is this project here, one of the the co-organizers of the system. I'm coordinating vectors. Patrick is coordinating Steve. So these two projects are a bit com complementary. Uh, they both have uh, uh, engineering part and uh, biomechanics part. Vectors is more on engineering design and control, uh, less on biomechanics. Etienne Burdet is part here, uh, also from the University of Brussels, Bram van der Bocht. Many people are there, of course, Antonio Bic and so on. And we developed all together very many actuators within that. And Steve is more on the biomechanics and a bit less on the technical part, yeah. So we developed um, many actuators within the project and we were requested to provide a unified way of presenting the results, the performance act of the actuator such that people are able to compare and choose the appropriate actuator for their application. So we came up with this kind of data sheet where we extended, you know, the standard data sheets you have for motors by the new characteristics which are relevant for this kind of actuators like minimum and maximum stiffness range, maximum storage energy and so on. Stiffness range is really important this is the no, um, this is the family of curves on, on of um, depending on on the position of the second motor showing how the stiffness evolves over torque so if you have a working point you can see what the stiffness range is at this working point that this is from my point of view a very very important characteristic because here you see for this design that you have some intersections which might cause some problems that's why a second generation try to produce this more human-like uh, uh, performance or uh, characteristics. And this is a video you might have seen on ICRA this year. Um, this is Sebastian doing some uh, hard experiments with, with, uh, with the arm. Um, here you can see the intrinsic compliance, so this is not controlled, but it's intrinsic due to the uh, variable compliance actuators. And then he's doing this kind of impacts you should not do, yeah, uh, you should not do it with, with a lightweight robot because you have acceleration of 200, 200 G. And this is the hand, I won't show this video because uh, Marcus will show that, so he will explain this in detail. But I will focus a bit on, on the control. And of course, now we have these very compliant systems, what is useful for cyclic movement involving energy storing, for example, for running or throwing. But for the simple point-to-point -point motions, of course, you need even more, even better control because the systems are more compliant, the, the stiffness is nonlinear and so on. Uh, well, basically, first we extended the, the modeling to to, to the variable compliance case, and basically the same as for for um, the flexible joint robot, you have a, a underactuated system, so you have less control inputs than uh, than the order of the system because uh, the tau x is the external disturbance, so tau one and tau two are the control inputs, so you have an underactuated system, and um, uh, but you have a positive definite V dot, making the linearized version of the or the linearization of the system controllable. This makes some things easier. And basically, we, since we have a lot of experience with control of of, of uh, flexible joint robots, it was quite straightforward to extend these ideas and uh, generalize this to to the uh, variable compliance case. I will talk only a bit about about impedance control in this context. Uh, a main difference compared to, to human muscles, and I hope to hear more also in Jerry Loeb's uh, presentation later on, is that humans have coupled 
polyarticular muscles, making cross couplings also in the stiffness matrix. While for um, integration reasons, in our arms we have only diagonal compliance. This makes some limitations, of course, because we have then only as many stiffness components as degrees of freedom. So you cannot provide a fully coupled joint stiffness matrix, and then you cannot provide uh, an arbitrary Cartesian stiffness matrix. So we are working now, this was a paper written by uh, Florian Petit and me, and accepted at IROS, on combining the intrinsic stiffness of the system with a control, uh, compliance controller, uh, such that you achieve the overall performance while you take as much as possible the compliance out of the actuators. So basically, first you design the compliance of the actuators as close as possible to the desired Cartesian one, and then add the coupled controller, because in, in control, of course, you can do any coupling you want. That's the advantage. You have the flexibility, but it's not intrinsic. So this is a current work we have. And I think I won't go into the, the t detail too much, but the basic idea is that using the Lagrangian and the equilibrium equations is very easy to uh, to define basically of a way of, of uh, doing impedance control for, for a general class of Euler Lagrange equations, such that um, yeah, maybe this is one important point. If you want to stay passive, you should not use for position feedback Q in the flexible joint case because you are then non collocated, but you should use theta. But you would like to use Q in order to. to get to the right position, because Q is describing your pose. So the trick we are applying is to define a variable Q bar, which is a function of theta only, but in any steady state situation is equal to Q by resolving the equilibrium equations, basically. And uh, if you write it for the non-collocated system, then, uh, well, they are non-linear equations, so do you need to solve them numerically, but uh, it's a contraction, so you have one uh, unique equilibrium. And by using in the control this Q bar instead of Q, you still stay within the passivity fr framework while achieving the desired position. And uh, I really won't go into details on that, but you de define just the controller based on Q bar. OK. Uh, I also won't go into the uh, damping design for, for this system. This is a paper written by, um, by uh, Florian Petit at ICRA. But instead of that, I will show just that we can do this control indeed and with vibration damping as for the flexible joint. Without vibration damping, you would have some strange motion. With vibration damping, you would perform very well, um, extending the approaches I presented before. And the last two minutes, I want just to show, yeah, yeah just one minute. I have two more slides. <laughs> I, I need to show those slides. <laughs> they, they can see it anyway. So <laughs> the basic idea is that um, you can store some energy into the springs. And uh, you can see here throwing an object with a rigid robot, rigid joint. And uh, still the power density is less than for the human arm, so you could not throw more than 0 0.8 meters, for example. While storing energy, you can do that. And this is, you know, exactly the same joint with, with energy storage. You can throw up to several meters. And uh, now we are extending it to, to several degrees of freedom, looking also to the way humans are doing that. But like I mentioned, Marcus will say more about this. And the last slide is that one about the work with Etienne, where we, again, used impedance control and controlled it based on the compliance of, of measured, or no, based on models about how humans adapt their compliance. And these models came out from some work of Etienne Bourdet at Imperial College. And he will certainly present that on Friday, Etienne, or when was it? On Thursday, something like that. So this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are zillions of questions, but there is no, not even one minute of time. Good news, however, this afternoon from exactly. 1 till approximately 3 p.m., there will be discussion with Aline and the panel here. So any question you have, save it for this afternoon. I even would say I would try to collect some questions at the beginning before the talk. So just think about your questions. I will distribute some cards and we will try to address them together. Hopefully also the, the speakers from yesterday and from the next days will be here to help answering those questions. So thank you.